Guten Tag und willkommen to episode 12 of my Germany vlog. And this time we're thinking, having thought last time about the consolidation of Nazi power, and this time we're focusing in on Hitler's um, power base by 1935 and to what extent he was um, a totalitarian dictator. Um, totalitarianism is, uh, I sort of define it as being someone who's in total control and um, that they that it's kind of like the absolutism i guess of, of the 20th century where um, that figure is in complete command of a situation and there's been an ongoing historical debate about whether hitler had achieved that by 1935 or indeed whether he ever achieved it remember of course our depth topic just looks at those early days of 33 35 so if you get a question about this it's likely to be a sort of change continuity question that that asks you how how much was hitler um, a dictator or fully in command or had totalitarian control by 1935 or perhaps um, a, a cause question kind of asking you um, uh, what the um, means by which he'd achieved that status where or, or maybe even a consequence question kind of looking at whether um, his totalitarian control is, is the biggest um, consequence of let's say the enabling act the change continuity question there is, is the more likely option though um, and historians have tended to view this, well, have viewed this in different ways and, and kind of fall into three sort of camps. The first one is to say that Hitler is, is in charge, that he is um, the dictator who is um, moulding, shaping and directing Germany at this time. And of course, politically, he's extremely secure by 1935. He has become Fuhrer, merging together the two offices uh, of Chancellor and President, and that's been endorsed um, in a public vote. The uh, Reichstag has been dismissed um, and, of course, the state landers have also uh, been removed as well. So politically, he has more power in his one individual um, uh, body, as it were, um, than anyone else since 1871. Coupled to that, the army take a personal oath to Hitler, um, a personal oath of loyalty to Hitler um, in August 1934 after the death of um, President Hindenburg. Um, and again, that, that just emphasises how Hitler personally um, is in power. And um, beyond that, Hitler tended to try and keep his, um, uh, his rivals, it's not really his rivals, it's, it's, it's kind of like subordinates um, who could potentially become rivals. Um, he tends to try and keep them isolated. So, for example, um, cabinet meetings, there have been 72 cabinet meetings in 1933. Um, you know, averaging out at kind of like 1.4 a week or so. Um, and they reduced to 12 in 1935, and in fact, four in 1936, just beyond our course end. So um, cabinet meetings uh, really become uh, a thing of the past. Decisions are not taken in them. Votes are not uh, held in them. And part of the reason for this is that Hitler is trying to keep those uh, cabinet members isolated from each other so that they have to um, bring their ideas to him. So these are all kind of signs of, of the strength of Hitler's position. Um, but there are historians who, who look at this and say, actually, this is a misleading picture. Uh, Martin Bormann, uh, Bormann is B-O-R-M-A-N, who was uh, worked with Hitler, uh, a Nazi, all the way through the war, talked about Hitler's government as being disorderly and dysfunctional. Um, partly this is due to the character of Hitler himself. His uh, working day was erratic, to say the least. He tended to stay up really late and then get up very late the next day. He would kind of potter at things in the afternoon, but was easily distracted. And then in the evenings, he would tend to kind of discuss um, whatever was uh, not necessarily a, an agenda, but, you know, whatever was kind of uh, being discussed that day, uh, watch films um, and then go to bed really late and then get up late the next day. He was not a very focused, um, strategic uh organised individual by any means. Uh, because of this, um, legislation wasn't discussed. He didn't put out ideas or proposals. Departments were not coordinated. And there was often overlap between things um, that they were attempting to do um, or wanted to achieve. So in all this way, that the, the actual workings of Hitler's government mean that it's difficult to say that power is centred in a focused way upon Hitler's individual. He, he doesn't seem to have taken command of that situation. And if we're talking back about this idea of totalitarian, you know, that does throw a question mark over that. 
Coupled with that, there were other people who had um, uh, power within this system. And so one of those is uh, Hans Heinrich Lammers. Lammers is L-A-M-M-E-R-S, who was head of the Reich Chancellery, effectively head of the civil service in Germany. Um, and he kind of acted as um, almost like a kind of uh, PA kind of figure to Hitler. He would um, arrange who could meet and speak with Hitler. And he would um, read the documents that Hitler was, was going to get. And he would kind of act as this conduit of information. Because of that, some ministers found it very easy to get access to Hitler because they were in Lammers um, good books, I guess. And other ministers, I think Walter Dare, the Minister of Agriculture, is picked out, I think, in the textbook as an example of this, found it really difficult to get um, close to Hitler. Now, what this shows, of course, is that it's not Hitler that is necessarily picking and choosing these meetings. Uh, there is another filter on the information before it gets to him. And, and Lammers plays um, an important and powerful role in that. Um, secondly, uh, in all this, uh, the Gauleiters were quite difficult to uh, control. Um, that job really fell to Minister of Interior Wilhelm Frick um, underneath Hitler. But um, there were often clashes between the Gauleiters and Frick. And uh, the Gauleiters kind of like independent, semi-independent um, mini Hitlers in the, in the States uh, wanted to do things their own way um, and would resist um, uh, and ignore commands from Frick. So again, this shows kind of like the dysfunctionality of the system, the overlapping responsibilities in the system and how it was potentially quite difficult for Hitler to um, ensure a smooth um, uh, government. And that, that, that therefore you could use that to question the extent to which he's in control. Finally, there are historians who talk about uh, the Nazi state as a polycratic state, a polycratic state. And by that, they mean that it's, it's not centred on one person's power. Actually, there are a number of people who have power and control um, in the Nazi state. Um, the Gauleiters could be used as an example of that. Um, Heinrich Himmler, Joseph Goebbels are good examples of that too. Um, let me just pick out for you Hermann Goering. And what they would say about Goering is that he has a number of hats. They sort of talk about um, these fiefdoms of power that they open up. So um, Goering was Prussian Minister of the Interior. He was Air Minister. He became Commander in Chief of the Luftwaffe. He was Commissar for Raw Materials and Foreign Exchange, and he was Gauleiter of Berlin. With all these kind of like in different um, portfolios uh, of power that he had, uh, uh, Goering had built up his own kind of territory that, that he commanded. Um, and in the Nazi state, um, several important and powerful ministers did that. In, in this way, they are a, 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 a rival, a challenge to the power of Hitler in the centre because it would be to Goering you might go to get answers. However, all that said, um, there are historians who have kind of sort of trodden a slight third way, I guess, which would be saying that um, power might well be distributed um, in, the, in the Nazi state, not centred just on Hitler, but authority was definitely centred on Hitler. Um, uh, some of those historians would say that actually Hitler allowed this kind of chaotic structure underneath him deliberately, that he was um, a social Darwinist who believed in survival of the fittest and that that, that was kind of being put, played out politically. Here, that he would allow departments and individuals to wrestle on ideas um, and to present him competing, contrasting um, options for what should happen so that Hitler retained that ability to pick and choose between the, the ideas and, and pick the best ideas. So firstly, he's kind of in, in command by seeming not to be in command in that sense. And then secondly, they emphasise what's called the Führer Princip or the Führer's Will idea. Now, this has been around since the 20s in the Nazi party, but it was basically um, what the Führer said, what Hitler said, went. And that your job as um, someone beneath Hitler in the food chain of the Nazi party, and then, of course, in the Nazi state, uh, your job was to... Uh, uh, work out what Hitler wanted and to see that it happened. And so in this way, and the classic example of this, and it goes well beyond our course, the, the, uh, the classic example is uh, Hitler's anti-Semitism and his desire to get rid of Jews was um, then um, worked out more and more radically um, by Hitler's subordinates um, without him ever having to say, let's get all the Jews gassed by 1943. Um, they work that out based on the idea that they know what he wants 
from reading Mein Kampf and from listening to his speeches. But this idea of like, loyalty to what the Fuhrer wants to see happen, um, in fact, leads to another idea, which is called cumulative radicalism. This idea that they kind of almost one up themselves to try and anticipate what Hitler wanted. And in this way, the ideas that they wrestle with together and bring before Hitler are all trying to impress Hitler as Fuhrer and show how he was actually in command of the situation. So in many ways, and that's the most satisfactory answer, I think, really. And that shows the authority that Hitler had over people in his party and people uh, within Germany as well. Backed up, of course, by terror, as we've seen in previous episodes. Um, he isn't in command of the day to day decision making, but he is in command of the overall shape. And he is able to enforce his will um, through the loyalty that others show him. I hope that's helpful. And um, next time we'll try and mop up the Nazis um, by looking at their uh, early racial policies and their idea of Volksgemeinschaft. See you then.